The Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 15 to 21. And from the day after the Sabbath, from the day on which you bring the sheaf of the elevation offering, you shall count off seven weeks. They shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh Sabbath. Fifty days. Then you shall present an offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your settlements two loaves of bread as an elevation offering, each made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of choice flour, baked with leaven, as first fruits to the Lord. You shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old, without blemish, one young bull, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, along with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering, and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of well-being. The priest shall raise them with the bread of the first fruits as an elevation offering before the Lord, together with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. On that same day you shall make proclamation. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not work at your occupations. This is a statute forever in all your settlements throughout your generations. Well, our second reading today is from the book of Acts, the second volume of Luke's Gospel. And uh, this passage today, uh, we read about the first day of Christian Pentecost. And we read beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one had heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. 
even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause briefly before we reflect. O oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you again for yet another moment in our lives when we can gather together with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to lift you up in praise. We thank you that you are always with us and always willing to receive our gratitude and our praise and to be glorified by it. God, everything we are, everything we have, everything we will be has been given to us by you. So we offer you praise today and seek your wisdom in Scripture. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, one Sunday, a little boy and his parents were driving home from church. That morning, their pastor, who was preparing for the Lenten season, uh, preached about Ash Wednesday, quoting the verse, You are dust, and to dust you will return. So the little boy asked, he said, Daddy, is that true about what the pastor said today, that before we're born we're dust, and after we die we go back to being dust? Dad replied, That's right, son. Why do you ask? The little boy said, Well, when we get home, you better come up to my room really quick because there are a lot of people under my bed who are either coming or going. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. But many things in life, they are unpredictable. Like the ways that uh, children connect some of what they hear in church to their lives. But uh, the same is true of God. Many of God's ways are also unpredictable to us. It's true that God's love for us and commitment to our eternal well-being is unquestionable. Scripture emphasizes that time and again. St. Paul famously wrote in the 8th chapter of his letter to the Romans, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. The only one who can separate us from God is us by choice. Scripture is clear about that. But how God's Spirit chooses to minister to us when it comes to issues related to our health, employment, relationships, education, finances, and other important aspects of life. Well, those can't always be anticipated. We can't understand God's ways at times. And we certainly can't control them. As St. Paul, uh, again, wrote later in that same letter to the Romans, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? In fact, if we come to a point in life when we think we've completely figured God out, you know, we've got God down to a science, well, then we're wrong. Because what we've really done is create a nice little idol that we've placed in a nice little box of our own creation. We've created a God, to be sure, but it's not really uh, a God at all and bears little resemblance to the almighty ancient of days that's described in Scripture. So this raises a question uh, in my mind. Uh, how do we relate to a God whose ways we can't predict and can never fully understand? 
How do we form a meaningful, genuine, lasting relationship with a being who is mysterious to us in many ways because, well, of us. Because our limited minds can't grasp the fullness of who God is. How can we relate? Well, that's the very thing that our scripture readings today speak to. They encourage us to forget about trying to control God and figure everything else out, but to instead embrace God intimately and to serve God boldly, regardless of whether we understand what God is doing at the moment or not. Now, our passage from the book of Acts, it tells us about this uh, amazing experience, this amazing story that the first Christians had on the day of Pentecost while they were gathered. Every year we celebrate Pentecost Sunday here in church. So we oftentimes think of that naturally as a Christian thing. You know, it's a Christian holiday. But before that... Pentecost was, and is to this day, among Jews, a Jewish festival. Now, the Greek word Pentecost literally just means 50th, and it refers to a Jewish holiday that traditionally takes place 50 days after the Passover feast. In Hebrew, it's called Shavuot, which literally means weeks, because, as we read in our passage from Leviticus today that Carolyn helped us through today, 50 days is about seven weeks. So Jews call Pentecost the festival of weeks. And in the ancient world, it was a really important festival just as today, but it served other functions. It was really a first fruits festival, if you will, where ancient Israelites offered the best of their grain and their herds in the temple of the Lord in the form of baked loaves of bread and their strongest, healthiest farm animals as a, as a celebration of the Israelites' journey into the fertile promised land that, as Scripture says, was flowing with milk and honey. See, Passover, that's celebrated around uh, Easter time for us, Passover was and is primarily a celebration of the Jews' liberation from slavery in Egypt. And Shavuot, it's about the blessings that follow after that liberation. It was a way to say, thank you, God, for the freedom and the prosperity we enjoy in this new land you gave us after freeing us from slavery. And in addition to making thank offerings to God on, on Shavuot, the ancient Israelites also shared all of the things they offered, the loaves of bread and the meat that they sacrificed by burning, they shared that with the poor. Uh, so the holiday was also an opportunity to spread prosperity around in Israelite society. So this festival of weeks, for many reasons, uh, was a really important holiday. And it was on this day, our reading from the book of Acts tells us, that God did something else. Additionally to all of the Shavuot, uh, uh, the traditions, he, he did something else in the lives of the first followers of Jesus. When we read that they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now, remember, uh, earlier Jesus told his followers to expect to receive the Holy Spirit at some point after his death. 
In the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. So Jesus' followers, they expected God's Spirit to show up in their lives as a helper, in particular, a, a parakletos in the Greek, which, which uh, Jesus uses in John's Gospel there, which referred to someone who would offer aid, someone who would assist in that way. And they expected this helper to somehow give them power, as Jesus also promised. But, as we've discussed in the past, what they didn't expect was God's Spirit, as we read in the story, to seemingly set the room they were in and their heads on fire and speak through them in ways that they couldn't understand. I mean, the Holy Spirit could have appeared as a gentle whisper, as he had to the prophet Elijah, or appeared in a dream to them like he did with uh, King Solomon and uh, many other people mentioned in Scripture. But God didn't do that in this instance. And why? Well, who knows? <laughs> we have no idea. As I said, we know that God's love for us and commitment to our well-being are unwavering. But God's ways of demonstrating those things have often left people scratching their heads. But you know something? That's okay. Because God doesn't expect us to understand everything. This is such an important truth about our faith. See, this is one way that I like to think about uh, this biblical truth, how Scripture sum, sums it up. God communicating with humanity. It's like us trying to explain how to open a checking account to a toddler. See, they don't know what we're talking about. They'll interact on a completely different level. They'll take the debit card from us that we're using to explain the checking account and they'll try eating it, you know, and they'll put it in their mouth because they don't understand what it is at that point in their lives. When we pull up to the ATM and we use that very card to get cash out of the machine, they're sitting in their car seat watching this. And they're amazed. It's totally unpredictable to them. Even if we explained it to them beforehand. See, some people think if God really loved me, he'd give me a clear reason for what's happening in my life right now. And people then get mad at God about this. They doubt that God exists and it impacts their faith in Christ. Sometimes they drift away from the church and drift away from believing. Which is so sad. Because the real problem isn't God. The real problem is that until we've entered the fullness of God's kingdom in eternity, until then we wouldn't be able to understand it in its fullness, even if God explained it to us. And think about it. God has been interacting with humankind since the beginning. And there's still so much about life that we still haven't figured out. Thousands of years of, of wisdom. We've gotten, uh, you know, we've made strides. We've, we've uh, you know, made some progress, but we still haven't figured everything out. If life was a comprehension test, humanity would have already failed that test a long time ago. At some point, if we want to have peace in this world, we've got to accept who we are. That in our current limited form, we're not compared to God, entirely like a child sitting on the carpet in God's house, a God's eternal kingdom, looking around and saying, you know, ah, to a lot of what we see. But again, that doesn't mean God loves us 
any less? I mean, does a, does a parent love their toddler any less just because their toddler can't fill out the family tax returns that year? Uh, I know human beings, we don't like hearing this because overall humanity has a pretty lofty view of our collective intelligence as a species. But the truth is, we're just not as bright as we think we are. Even Einstein and Tesla, not the car, the guy, are not as bright as we think we are. Instead, serving God faithfully is about how we respond to our limitations. So how, in our passage, did Jesus' followers respond to God's ways that were so unpredictable and inexplicable to them? Did they assume that it couldn't be God because God doesn't do this? Uh, did they say, this is Shavuot, a festival when this or that always happens. You know, people bring the bread, they bring the, the animals, we eat meat. So God couldn't possibly have just right now set my head on fire. That's not included in the website description of today's service. Uh, did, did they try to squeeze God into a nice little box of their own creation? No. Instead, they forgot about trying to understand everything and control everything and instead embraced God as God appeared to them. They embraced God intimately and then they served God boldly. In verse 14, uh, Peter begins with a joke, which I suppose is understandable after what he's just experienced in the, the room with the Holy Spirit and all. He, he stands up before the crowd and he boldly declares, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, these people are drunk as you think, because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. So he's trying to soften up the crowd a little bit. So they'll listen then to what he has to say. After which he quotes the prophet Joel and talks about how all people who believe would receive a close, intimate, profound experience of God's Spirit that would empower them to serve him. So because Jesus' earliest followers didn't try to completely figure out everything, but instead responded to what was happening in the moment. They responded to God's unpredictable ways by doing what they did, embracing and serving God anyway. They were able to share God's grace with others. A lot more people than anybody could have expected that day. And the same is true for us. And our helper, God's Spirit, is always with us, just as powerfully as he was with those first followers of Christ on that first Christian Pentecost. And if we embrace the unpredictable ways that God chooses to minister to us when it comes to everything in our lives, be it health, employment, relationships, education, whatnot, he will give us the opportunity to experience and share his love as profoundly as those early disciples did. So our passages today, they challenge us to ask ourselves, do I have the courage to dive wholeheartedly into my relationship with God? To embrace God in every situation, including in those situations that I simply don't understand. Amen.